Hello everyone, I once again welcome you all to MSP lecture series on advanced transition metal chemistry. Uh, this is uh, the 15th lecture in the series. In my previous lecture, I did discuss about uh, John Taylor distortion and I was telling you about uh, complexes of this type. Here you can see clearly 6 anionic ligands are there and copper is in plus 2 state. To compensate 4 charges we have lead in plus 2 state and 2 alkali metals in their plus 1 oxygen state. So, it is now it is a, a charge balanced complex and this complex shows temperature dependent John Taylor distortion. The interesting thing is with variation in the alkali metal or cation it shows distortion at different temperatures. When M is cesium it shows tetragonal elongation below 285 Kelvin with complex ion adopting tetragonal symmetry whereas for M equals potassium distortion occurs at below 273 Kelvin and once again similar distortions were observed for M equals rubidium at less than 276 Kelvin and when M is thallium it appeared at less than 245 Kelvin. And above these temperatures the molecule appears octahedral due to dynamic John Taylor effect. So, it is not only John Taylor distortion we come across we can also see dynamic process with temperature. So, I have listed all electronic configuration D1 to D10 to just assess what electronic configuration really shows John Taylor distortion in complexes in case of both high spin and low spin. If you just see uh, when we have one electron in d orbital irrespective of uh, uh, high spin or low spin. So, they show weak John Taylor distortion and when we have d4 electronic configuration that means E g has one electron and also in case of d9 where we have 3 electrons we come across very strong John Taylor distortion that is what we saw in case of chromium 2 plus and copper 2 plus octahedral complexes. In case of d5 and d3 D8 and D10 we do not see at all and in case of uh, D6 and D7 we come across again weak uh, John Taylor effects. And in case of low spin whether you take D1, D2, D4, D5 in all these cases we do come across weak John Taylor distortion whereas in case of D3, D6, D8 and D10 we do not see at all only in case of D7 and D9 we do come across down to the distortion in case of low spin complexes. Of course, in case of D9 irrespective of whether it is low spin or uh, high spin it is going to show strong John Taylor distortions. Then fine theoretically by just looking into the E g electronic configuration to an extent T 2 g electronic configuration we can predict the possibility of a complex showing John Taylor distortion. But how to assess the presence of John Taylor distortion in complexes? Two important uh, aspects that comes to our mind to assess this uh, John Taylor distortion are electronic spectroscopy and crystal structure data. Of course, crystal structure data is quite straightforward and the moment you determine X-ray structure you will come across variations in the bond length that is bonding parameters that should tell you whether it is elongation is observed or com precision is observed. How electronic spectra of uh, you know these complexes vary let us look into this here. In the absence of John Taylor distortion absorption spectrum shows only one transition whereas the complexes with the tetragonal distortion usually show two transitions and we call it as double hump pattern. How this double hump pattern uh, appears? Okay, this is the one without John Taylor distortion you can see simple one absorption here. And when we see John Taylor distortion we see two intensities here and, and of course one is weaker and one is stronger then how to visualize this one through electronic transitions. So, let us look into the electronic transition that are responsible for showing this kind of absorption. Without John Taylor distortion you can always anticipate one transition from T 2 G to E G, but irrespective of whether we have Z elongation or Z compression with tetragonal distortion 
due to Jantler effect they show two electronic transitions and this is the one and this is the one here in case of uh, elongated complexes in case of compressed complexes also we see two electronic transitions. And this explains why we see double hump pattern like this in this pattern. So that means there is a way to assess and understand whether John Teller distortion is there or not if it is there to what extent it is effective whether it is weaker or stronger can also be assessed simply by looking into the absorption spectrum of a particular complex. So what is second order John Teller distortion? The second order John Teller distortion occurs when the excited state of the transition metal has unequal occupation of d orbits with identical energies. That means once when you excite an electron from the ground state to excited state and if the excited state has unequal occupation of d orbitals very similar to d4 and d9 then we can anticipate second order John Teller distortion. The ground state of the transition metal may not have unequal occupation of degenerate orbitals. So, so therefore, the second order John Teller distortion is also called pseudo John Teller distortion. And if you just want to look into the potential energy surface, this is how it looks. And this is at a high symmetry point where there is no effect. And this is in case of John Teller effect. Whereas in case of this one it is pseudo John Teller effect you can see here splitting between the two electronic levels and this is again high symmetry point and this electronic state 2 and uh, electronic state 1 similarly electronic state 2 here and the electronic state 1 is here. So you can also see pseudo John Teller distortion, regular John Teller distortion and also second order effect will also be there this is because of the excited state in which uneven filling of electron or uneven electron occupation is observed. Now let us look into high spin and low spin complexes of the type hexa aqua uh, m with a particular oxygen state for metals having d1 to d10 electronic configuration. So I have listed here for 3D series uh, starting from d1 to d10 and D1 the most common one here if you consider it is uh, titanium 3 plus and one electron is there and in case of titanium 2 plus D2 system we have two electrons are there and vanadium 3 plus uh, three unpaired electrons are there and in case of D4 uh, chromium 3 plus we have four unpaired electrons are there. Um, this entire series is due to high spin complexes and in case of D5 we have two levels both are singly occupied. So maximum unpaired electrons can be seen example Mn2 plus so th this is 3D5 and 4S2 when you remove 4S uh, electrons it will be D5 system similarly 3D6 4S2 remove 3 electrons so that Fe will be in plus 3 state this is D5 and case of D6 again Fe2 plus and cobalt 3 plus we have 4 unpaired electrons and in case of cobalt 2 plus D7 system we have 3 unpaired electrons and nickel 2 plus octahedral we have 2 unpaired electrons D9 system we have 1 unpaired electron and in case of D10 zinc cadmium and mercury so we do not have any unpaired electrons at all. And of course only uh, D4, D5, D6, D7 show both high spin and low spin complexes and the electronic configuration I have given here. This series is for low spin complexes and this series is for high spin complexes. And this is a consolidated uh, uh, diagram that shows various crystal field splittings of the d orbitals under the influence of a different uh, ligand field. You can clearly see here this is for tetrahedral and uh, of course this is degenerate system in the absence of ligand field and when you have this octahedral ligand field this is how the splitting is and then if you go for D a, a B C is this one and if you go for D I have listed here tetragonal elongation and when you have tetragonal elongation this T2G as well as EG will be further split and this is what exactly looks like and uh, if you recall this is very similar to a square planar and of course when you have strong this ligand field the DZ square again comes below DXY and DXY goes little bit up. So that means elongation has something to do with square planar geometry as it shows similarities and then the E 
a square planar complex you can see here as I mentioned it comes little down here and this is a typical uh, square planar splitting and in case of uh, F this is for trigonal bipyramidal one. And also you can see the relative CFAC crystal energy and also relative separation between the HOMO and LUMO. In, in case of molecular orbital theory we frequently use highest occupied molecular orbital and lowest unoccupied molecular orbital the gap between that one is called crystal field stabilization energy same thing we use in uh, ligand field theory also. So, keep that in mind and uh, this is how uh, one can show consolidated uh, diagram for various ligand fields. So, now let us look into the relationship between octahedral and square planar which goes through tetragonal distortion and then losing one ligand to achieve square pyramidal and eventually when you take off this ligand also in axial position we will end up with square planar. So, that means when you change from octahedral to distortion tetragonal distortion in particular tetragonal elongation and then get rid of one ligand uh, to have square pyramidal geometry and then get rid of this one to end up with square planar geometry. Then let us look into the relative positions of uh, various d orbitals when we try to do this transformation from octahedral to square planar. You can see here the relative energies and how they are going to transform can be clearly seen here. This is tetragonal elongation. Of course, tetragonal elongation remains uh, more or less same uh, for square pyramidal there is no change that means the crystal field splitting whatever we write for octahedral with tetragonal elongation holds good for square pyramidal geometry as well. So, that means if you remember octahedral remembering for tetragonal elongation by looking into what actually happens to these orbitals and then that remains more or less same for uh, square pyramidal geometry and then here only the difference between square pyramidal and square planar is dz square comes further down whereas dxy energy is slightly elevated that is it. So, that now remembering the crystal field splitting is rather much easier. Again I have listed here the relative energy of, of various d orbitals with respect to the corresponding uh, ligand field I have shown here this is what exactly I wrote in the previous one and this is in this is written in a different format here ok. And here I have included uh, square planar, trigonal bipyramidal and uh, square pyramidal and octahedral and also here I have included pentagonal bipyramidal and here square antiprism I have included and here this is tetrahedral. So, many textbooks give this kind of splitting diagram only for standard octahedral and tetragonal elongation and compression and uh, square planar geometries, but not for many others that is the reason I thought I should include crystal field splitting for most of the geometries we come across in coordination chemistry with coordination number varying from 2 to 9. So, now I have listed here various ligands in the order of their ligand field strength and this we call it as spectrochemical series and there is a background for spectrochemical series that is crystal field theory. So, crystal field theory uh, through CFSC that can be measured using electronic spectroscopy later I shall elaborate more about the electronic spectroscopy. So, using that one you can look into the relative strengths of these ligands and you can put them at, at appropriate place or give appropriate rank in the spectrochemical series. So, this is in the increasing order of uh, ligand field strength and among them I have listed here short one iodide is the weakest ligand whereas cyanide, carbon monoxide and uh, tertiary phosphines are the strongest ligands. And of course, uh, when you look into crystal field theory through CFSC you can judge whether a ligand is weak or strong with respect to another ligand, but why a particular ligand is a weak ligand, why a particular ligand is strong ligand that information really does not come here. It can only show through experiment what happens, but when you go to molecular theory I shall tell you how to classify these ligands and why a given ligand is a weak ligand or a strong ligand or of intermediate strength that I shall clarify when I go to 
molecular orbital theory. So, I have given an extended spectrochemical series here, I have given an extended spectrochemical series here, this includes most of the ligands we come across and also I have listed some important weak field ligands here for example, water, fluoride, chloride and uh, hydroxo. And similarly, I have also listed important strong field ligands carbon monoxide, cyanide, ammonia, triphenylphosphine. So, before I try to make it very clear about how to write crystal field splitting diagrams starting from octahedral. So, let me list some of those geometries we come across among coordination compounds. The most common one is octahedral with coordination number 6, tetrahedral coordination number 4 and again square planar coordination number 4, linear we have 2 and trigonal planar 3, square pyramidal 5, trigonal bipyramidal 5, again trigonal prismatic 6, trigonal antiprismatic or octahedral same 6, hexagonal planar 6, pentagonal bipyramidal 7 and hexagonal bipyramidal 8 and cubic 8, dodecahedral 8, bicap trigonal prismatic 8, square antiprismatic 8 and tricapital trigonal prismatic 9. We have plenty of uh, examples for each case among coordination compounds. Now, to make you familiar with writing crystal field diagrams for any given geometry, I will start with octahedral compounds. This is what is very important, you should be able to write Cartesian coordinates and then you should be able to identify different planes we come across. For example, if you assume this is z axis and this is x axis and this is y axis, you should be able to distinguish between x y plane and x z plane and y z plane. And then you should be able to assess the orientation of uh, different orbitals with respect to Cartesian coordinates and also you can see their impact when the ligands are approaching the metal from different directions as per the defined geometry for that particular complex. So, first what you should do is write Cartesian coordinates and here the origin is there try to place your metal at this 0 and then identify the plane and you can see clearly x y plane and this is x z plane and this is y z plane. Now, you start putting dz square, dz square orientation is in this direction. Now, we know if the ligands are approaching in this direction, what would happen to the energy of dz square in that particular ligand field can be clearly visualized here. Similarly, I am going to put d x minus y square, this is along x minus x and y minus y. So, whatever the ligands approaching in this direction uh, would have impact if electrons are already present in this orbital. Now, it is dxy, dxy is slightly spread between x and y plane to take x minus y square and just rotate it by 45 degree that will change to dxy. So, this is also in the xy plane, but is between the planes. Now, xz plane we have and then we have yz. So, this should be understood properly and once you understand properly, so writing crystal field splitting diagram for anything can be very easy and it is not memory based you should remember it is not memory based, but you should have good analysis of impact on those things so that you can write relative energy of d orbitals with respect to any given crystal field or ligand field. Now, I have uh, written two octahedral molecules with the six uh, ligands shown here and this is the place where metal is sitting. So, now I am putting here set of dz square and dx minus y square, you can see here they are coming on their way directly that means energy of these two should be elevated higher increases. And on the other hand if you see here dxy, dxz and dyz and strictly speaking, so they are not coming on the way of ligands, but they are in between as a result the impact of ligand field is less on them their energy is lower. So, now without worrying too much you should be able to write crystal field splitting doubly degenerate these two and triply degenerate these three. And this is how we arrived at the octahedral crystal field splitting here with respect to Barry center. It is very easy, so remember this one practice couple of times and you will not do any mistake in writing crystal field splitting diagram for other geometries. Now, let us look into uh, tetrahedral molecule. 
and of course you can also write like this. And to understand ligand field influence it is very ideal to imagine this tetrahedral molecule inside a cube something like this. This is a cube here with intention I have shown alternate corners with the different uh, colored spheres. This is the tetrahedral molecule I am visualizing here this is the metal center and these are the uh, red ones are the 4 ligands present at alternate vertices of this symmetric cube. Now once if you make uh, connections to central metal from these 4 ligands then you will end up with a regular tetrahedral geometry and now what you should do is the way I place the Cartesian coordinates you place the Cartesian coordinates and then place all the 5D orbitals and you can see the influence of ligand field on this one. In this case what happens none of this dx square minus y square or dz square will be coming on the way of uh, direction of approach of ligand and in contrast dxy, dyz and dxz would be having little larger overlap with the direction of approach of the ligand as a result reversal of octahedral splitting takes place in this one. Hence we write in this fashion crystal field splitting for tetrahedral molecules here. So, energy is elevated here and if you just write you can see uh, they have larger overlapping whereas here less overlapping. So, energy of E will be lower why we call E and T2 because it is non centrosymmetric. So, T2 dxy, dy, dxz and dyz. Now, let us look into one more this is the tetrahedral molecule just I explained. So, here one system and I have another system here that means here I have used alternate corners in this fashion let me use other alternate corners to generate one more tetrahedral molecules. What would happen if I superimpose this one on this one something like this. If I superimpose these two it appears like you know, the metal is common but it is making bond with all 8 corners having almost uh, coordination number 8. This is what I am referring to cube cubic splitting. So, that means when the ligand 8 ligands are approaching the metal to form a metal complex with composition M L 8 having cubic structure this is how you can visualize. That means if I make an attempt to write crystal field splitting for this one it should be very similar to that of tetrahedral. That means two tetrahedral molecules you superimpose on another one in opposite direction you end up with common metal and 8 ligands occupying 8 corners of cube. So, that means the crystal field splitting of cubic system is more or less is identical to that of tetrahedral. So, that means tetrahedral and cubic have the same crystal field splitting ok further it is simplified. So, in my next class I shall tell you more about uh, several other geometries until then have an excellent time reading and digesting crystal field theory and especially chemistry of transient elements.